Welcome everyone. I'm very excited to have a great blessing to come together today in this beautiful spring day and share with you a wonderful topic by an amazing scholar of the Quran, Dr. Salih Yücel. And the title of his talk today is The Quran and Holistic Therapy. Does Quran read the reader? This is Zuleyha Çolak, a senior lecturer at Columbia University and a member of the Respect Graduate School family and our global community. And I'm very, very grateful and humbled to be with you today. As you have been with us for the last three events in Risale Academy lecture series project, we hope to bring scholars of the Quran through the lens of the Risale collection by Said Nursi, a 20th century scholar from Turkey, and the renewal of faith, to share the, our scholars' knowledge and facilitate critical readings, interactions, engagement, and discussions on Risale around thematically organized topics to increase in knowledge, knowledge and critical deeper engagement of Muslim and non-Muslim audience. Our audience could be anyone who wants to deepen a critical understanding of faith. We hope to provide a public education and training on deeper understanding of Risale i Nur collection in relation topics of interest in our world today. We also hope to gather a community of scholars and students for academic study of the Risale-i Nur collection and share the knowledge with the global world online. We have so far talked about a critique of modernity with Dr. Adnan Aslan in our first lecture and the discussion on atheism and theism with Dr. Hakan Gök. And in our third lecture, we had Dr. Zeki Sarı Toprak on the topic of death and beyond. And after today's program with Dr. Salih Yücel, we will have Dr. Ömer Kuru from the UK on the problem of the self according to Quran through the lens of the Risale-i Nur. Allah says in the Quran, we are sending down the Quran in parts it's a healing and a mercy for the believer. Researchers show that the Quran can be therapeutic particularly for those who have psychological problems. However, many people are not aware of how this holistic therapy can be achieved. This, conver this conversation will focus on the Quranic healing and its holistic methodology today. It's a great honor to have with us today my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Yonara Barbosa, an amazing student of the Universal Wisdom and Knowledge, who will be the discussant of our lecture today. And I would like to express my thanks for Dr. Salih Yücel for being with us today. And now I would like to introduce him for you. Dr. Salih Yücel completed his Bachelor of Islamic Theology, a five-year program and equivalent to undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Ankara in 1982. He undertook various roles for 10 years for the Ministry of Religious Affairs in Turkey, subsequent to attaining his Australian permanent residence status, he completed a Master of Theology at the University of Sydney in 1996. He continued his postgraduate studies in the United States and completed his doctorate at Boston University in 2007. His doctoral research was on the effect of prayer on Muslim patients' well-being. Dr. Yücel also worked as a Muslim chaplain at Harvard Medical School's hospitals for seven years. After 10 years in the United States, he returned to Australia in 2007. Professor Yücel worked as senior lecturer at the Center for Religious Studies at Monash University between 2008 and 2014. Currently, he teaches at the Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization at Charles Sturt University in Sydney, Australia. He is also a provisional CPE supervisor. He is the author of four books, co-author of one book, and a number of articles and book chapters. Please feel free to subscribe our channel and share it with your friends 
And I would like to welcome Dr. Salih Yücel for joining us today. And the stage is yours, Professor Yücel. Welcome. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. First of all, let me say that it's a timely program. Uh, the reason because particularly uh, COVID-19 create a huge problem, psychological problem uh, throughout the world, including the country I live in, Australia. And, and therefore, this program, I think, is unique, particularly for, for the Muslims, because uh, the Quran is their uh, sacred text. And uh, if they understand the wisdom of recitation and reading and how it can be helpful for their, uh, particularly, again, for psychological problems, I think uh, uh, it is timely that uh, we should discuss uh, this topic. Uh, if you look at uh, in the last approximately 20 years, the literature about uh, Islam and healing, whether it is prayer and healing, dhikr, remembrance of God and healing, dua and healing, uh, or meditation and healing is growing. In the, in the West, it started probably 100 years ago. However, if you look at during the classical period, there are many works that were written by major scholars, by great scholars, um, about uh, you know, the, the Quran and healing, or the Sunnah of the Prophet and healing. Uh, first of all, as uh, uh, Zuleha recited the, the meaning of the one Quranic verse, which is which is in Arabic, is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, yes, you know we we send down this Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers. But how come that Quran can be the healer? How it can be the the mercy? Our topic we are going to discuss the healer. Uh, I was. Uh, talking to one of my friends and he had some problems and, but he was a very uh, good Quran reader. He would read probably every day, more than 20, 25 pages, 30 pages, but according to rules and regulations. And uh, he said that uh, while once I was reading the Quran also, I felt that the Quran is reading me as well. Maybe this is kind of like a spiritual experience. It's hard to, explain scientifically and I came across such uh, uh, examples through my chaplaincy uh, work in the hospitals jails in more than almost 30 years I started in Australia I continued in the United States when I came back to Australia even I was an academic still I continued to this, to do this chaplaincy work because I saw that the great benefit I am helping those who are in need I think that's to me, this is the Islam. But how that can happen? Of course, the first one, it's the Muslim sacred text is the Quran. And the second one, the Sunnah of the Prophet. When we look at the Sunnah of the Prophet, by the way, in the Quran, there are six verses related that the Quran is uh, for healing. Six verses, directly, indirectly, it's related. And in the Quran, what we see that uh, the one name of Allah also is called a shifa, which means the healer. And we see in the, the story of Ibrahim, Abraham, he also indicates that, you know, my Lord will heal me. So I look at some exegetical words, some tafsirs. What, what do they say about such chronic verses? So there are uh, two major different point of view. The first one is that Quran heals psychological problems, not physical ones. But second view, it heals psychological and even, not always, but even sometimes it can be physicals as well. When we say physicals, it's more preventative for prevention of different type of illnesses and sicknesses. So uh, if you look at for example, well-known scholar uh, Tabari ibn Kathir, uh, they uh, state that Quran heals hypocrisy, doubts, spiritual diseases, particularly the spiritual disease in the heart, which is causing a huge problem today uh, in regard to family life or community 
or at workplace. And, and therefore they say that the Quran is healer. And uh, some great scholars such as Ibn Qayyim al jawziya al suyuti uh, well-known classical uh, scholars, and they wrote books about that they called at tabin Nabawi, the medicine of the prophet. Uh, even you know, after the Quran, Bukhari is the second uh, sacred source of Islam, which is very important again after the Quran. Uh, when I look at it, there are 129 hadith, the sayings of the prophet, related to healing. You know, the, the, whether related to the Quran and healing or some certain type of medications. And it, it's interesting, Bukhari allocated a chapter of his hadith books to, you know, the medicine of the prophet. And I thought that why, you know, he, he dedicated. Because in, the, in his biography, he was born as a blind baby. The mo mother was very pious. So according to the uh, biographer, uh, the mother, you know, started praying for almost three years, sometimes even weeping. And one night she saw Ibrahim salam, Abraham in, in her dream. Abraham told her that you, your son will get well and he will see tomorrow. When she woke up, when Bukhari woke up, he saw that Bukhari's eyes are okay. He could, he could see and he could sight. So I think that's why Bukhari wanted to allocate a, a huge section of his book related to the Tibb al you know, prayer and healing or the medicine of the prophet. And then later, Ibn al-Qayyim al, -Qayyim al he developed this, he wrote a book, uh, al suyuti and also in the section of the Tafsirs and many other great scholars, they wrote books about at tibb al-Nabawi. Because when we look at the history of Islam, all great scholars also, they were doctors as well. You know, they were kind of like a combination of medicine, jurisprudence, hadith, even sometimes tafsir or history. So they were not just a scholar of the religion, but also they were a scholar of the medicine to a certain extent as well. So that's why uh, Quran emphasized on, on healing and uh, all I'll discuss later, there are many things that particularly in the last 20 years, years have been written um, about the Quran, how, how the Quran can be the healer if it is done accordingly. But for the Quran to be, you know, to be a healer, there, there are some certain criteria. As you know, if you would like to study uh, any science, there are certain criteria in academia. So similarly, for the Quranic studies or for Quranic healing as well, when someone follows such criteria, will be able to find the benefit of the Quran. One of them, for example, uh, it's written by... Uh, Adnan Al-Tarshi, he is a Saudi scholar. Uh, the book is uh, the, the Quranic Healing or, or the Medicine of the Prophet and Sport. So he says that during the recitation of the Quran, you know, you give break. Those who know touch with the rules of the Quran, you know, for example, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, then you can a deep breath. They say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and break with deep breath. Then what that happens, you know, even in today in, in psychology, they recommend you to have such things. And I remember uh, once one of the well-known psychologists in the United States, he came to uh, my hospital where I was working, I think it was 2005 or 2006. Uh, he started how to get rid of depression. And then he talked about deep breath. And then he said, you know, uh, bow down and prostrate and so on. Well, I said that, I ask him a question, whatever you say, actually, this is uh, uh, the actions of prayer in Islam. And we recite the Quran, we give breaks, such like that, and we bow down, we prostrate. And he said, uh, we said I said that this is salat, we call prayer, you know, ritual prayer. Interestingly, he said that I'm very impressed with your prayer, very impressed in regarding how to get rid of such, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, and so on. So I think as much as we dig in, we find or we research, uh, an academic will come to conclusion that the Quran is really 
helpful, particularly for you know depression, anxiety, and other type of mental illnesses. Therefore, yes, uh, from my personal experience as a chaplain in last more than 30 years in, in the United States in Australia, I can say that you know uh, the best thing when I was reciting the Quran to the to patients, and they found a great benefit. And also, I did even my doctorate uh, because of that. That I saw that I saw the benefit. Uh, but it was not uh, kind of like a tangible, not objective, more subjective. But I wanted to do research and, and see the level of objectivity of you know reading and recitation of the Quran or dhikr or making dua, you know, by the client or for the client. This is very interesting. Uh, you have also, I remember you have also presented a paper in uh, uh, our conference at Respect Graduate School, which was on pastoral and spiritual care during the pandemic. It was a virtual conference. Uh, and you uh, presented a paper uh, titled An Islamic Therapy, Fear Reducing Holistic Approach. Uh, so you may, if, you, if you think it is uh, related to this topic, uh, can you mention a little bit about that research as well? Well, thank you. I think, yes, it is. Uh... That paper is was it is the summer of my chaplaincy life. Let me say that, mm -hmm. because I have been doing chaplaincy in the last more than thirty years in the hospitals, in the jails, uh, whether paid or volunteer based. Uh, then I said that I should you know write a paper for this, and I was doing my research and I came across first of all, uh, you know how that happened historically. Uh, there is. Uh, a book by Ivy Sena or Ibn Sina, a well-known philosopher, also a doctor, Kitab Shifa, the Book of Healing. Uh, when I look at the Book of Healing, what Ibn Sina does, uh, in the West we call it a secular approach. Mm -hmm. But in Islam, I wouldn't call that even a secular approach because he is you know, kind of like a, a reading a human being, not just, not, not just a book. Uh, you know, human being is like a book for him, and he's trying to find out what's going on, whether physically or psychologically. So Ibn Sina, he argues that there, there is correlation between body, mind, and soul. And then he says that five external senses are connected to five internal senses. Mm -hmm. That's his theory. And he, he says that human being is a mirror. So particularly, you know, the, the faculty of imagination. So he, he argues that whatever we perceive through our five senses, it will be stored in our faculty of imagination. Mm -hmm. Whether, you know, through smelling, sighting, touching, uh, tasting, hearing. Particularly at the young age, you know, when a person grows up and later that could reflect in, in our personal life. So he, he says that, so as much as if we are able, you know, to have good things or perceive good things through five senses, external five senses, psychologically, that will reflect, will connect into in the five internal senses and, and we will have a happy life. So he classifies happiness uh, in three. One is, he says, the first degree is like eating or um, having you know, sexual relationship with the opposite gender. He says that animal does this as well. But this, this joy is temporary. And then second, he calls wahmi. Uh, uh, which is, we, we think that, we imagine that, we estimate that happiness, such as, you know, having uh, a good salary, a good income, a house, a car in our modern day, you know, a, a, a family. And he says, this is also temporary as well. However, the third type of joy, he says, the intellectual joy. The intellectual joy, uh, 
it is more spiritual. And he says that the peak of inter, inter, intellectual joy is experienced by the prophets. And later, you know, maybe their followers or by the believers according to the degree of their faith. And when I look at, you know, also in the nurses book, you know, how come if you look at the history of humanity, uh, most of the prophets, they suffered a lot. And then we see their companions. Look at the life of the disciple of Jesus. Peace and blessing be upon him. Look at the life of the companions of the prophet and later great scholars. Almost all of them, they suffered in one way and other ways. So then the question is, how they could bear? And for Ibn Sina, if someone tastes that intellectual joy, and in, in such case, this person will be able to face the challenges, to manage the challenges. So uh, then he, he discusses the concept of waham, negative perception or negative estimation, which is uh, part of our daily life. First of all, for Said Nursi, when I was reading his books, you know, my, my theory is, as I said, it's a combination of uh, Ibn Sina's rational approach, but uh, injected the spiritual injection of Said Nursi, a combination of this both theory. And so we imagine, that's part of human nature. If we cannot imagine, we cannot progress. We can't do anything. You know, let me say, you want to go to Manhattan. What will you do first? Think, you know, how should I go? Go by train, by car, in which way? We imagine. And then I put in practice. So God created that imagination power to be creative. However, for Ibn Sina and also Said Nush as well, some people, they are very sensitive. They have high IQ. Those who are very smart, they're more vulnerable, you know, having such negative assumption. It is more likely compared with others. So when they perceive through their five senses, when they start it, and sometimes they think, started thinking negatively. And of course, when it's not under the control, when it is not managed properly, and then gradually it caused huge problem in this person's life. Then here and the Quran and the son of the prophet comes in, I think. We can see, you know, how we can use these five senses or keep busy five senses in a better way that we could perceive the positive things store in our mind and think positively. I think the Quran is number one from my personal experience and also for, for my research as well. Because what I did in my research, by the way, what motivated me to this research, I was working at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, which is Harvard uh, Medical School affiliated uh, teaching hospital. And one day I visited uh, a patient who was unconscious, dying. And uh, I entered the room. I asked the nurse first, because it was in, in the intensified care, I asked her permission. So I entered, you know, her section. I res in, in Islamic faith, we recite generally for such people, you know, Surah Yasin, the chapter of Yasin from, in the Quran, or some other certain chapters that is recommended, which I did. And it was about emotional for me as well. You know, I put myself in the shoes of the patient, look, Sally, you are dying. What will you think? What do you need at that, at that point? a bit emotional for me too and when i when i leave the, the section the nurse approached me she, she said that what did you do to this patient i said uh, did i do anything wrong she said no i look at the vital signs all got better the heart beat blood pressure i was surprised that time still i was doing my course for my doctorate and i said mm, i should think about that maybe i can do my thesis my research about that as well then I developed my research design. I prepared some questions. What I did, uh, I asked, I recruited 60 patients. I asked them to recite the Quran. If they cannot recite, cannot read, okay, they can make dhikr. Any remembrance, could be la ilaha illallah, you know, could be subhanallah, alhamdulillah, for seven minutes. Uh, if they cannot, then I did for them. So in seven minutes, of course, before 
I read the Quran or made supplication, I recorded the vital signs. So then first, if the patient could do, the patient did it sometimes. If they couldn't, then I did it. And then after the prayer or recitation of the Quran, I recorded the vital signs again. So I wanted to see the measure, whether it's helpful or not. And, and then with the second time, this time I did not recite the Quran or any dua. I recorded the vital signs again. I talk, read just, you know, a story. Maybe, you know, any stories that from a novel book or, you know, from your daily life. It's not the Quran, it's not dhikr. And then I recorded the vital signs again because I wanted to measure it, you know, whether uh, is the Quran helping, the dhikr, the dua is helping, or my presence is helping. And then, of course, I, was, I was not expert, you know, to measure this. I took to a doctor and also a psychiatrist who measured this, uh, you know, uh, data for me. And, and the result is that the recitation of the Quran and Dua and Dhikr is helping over 90, 95%. It's helping for the blood pressure, for the heartbeat, you know, uh, for the psychological body, they also ask the questions as well before and after the, uh, the prayer. And the result shows that uh, recitation of the Quran and making dua or making dhikr, whether by patient or by someone else, is helping. Uh, it, it shows psychologically, as I said, over 90%. But physically, of course, this is not my expertise area. We need a team to find out whether it's helping physically or not. So my, my research is only from a psychological perspective. So that's why since that time, I believe that even scientifically that the Quran is really helping for healing purpose. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you a question about, you know, how you implement this uh, measurement and whether or not the meaning of the Quran is critical. Does the patient understand what is read or is it only the recitation in Arabic affect the patients? What do you think about that? Did you see any difference in both cases or have you tried uh, any experiment on that? Yes, well, good question. Uh, first of all, uh, the general view of the Muslim scholars in, in the Quran itself, that Quran does not address only the mind. Mm -hmm. And the reason, if when we look at it, for example, non-Arabic people, Muslims, approximately knows 80% of the Muslim population in the world, they do not understand the Quran. However, they read and on daily basis. And sometimes, even what we see that, uh, they read 20 pages, 50 pages, some people, if I ask someone else, well, can you read a book in French who does not know French? Can you read it for me two times? It will be boring. You know, how come? You know, I, I, I cannot understand. Why should I read? But the Quran, I think this is one of the, according to Said Nursi, that one of the, also other scholars, that it's a miracle of the Quran. Although many Muslims do not understand the meaning of the Quran, but still they read and recite and recite and recite. I was talking to my uh, elder brother a couple of weeks ago. I said, what are you doing? You know, is Corona is really affecting everyone. How about your life? He said, oh, no worries, I'm happy. Why? I have more time to read my Quran. <laughs> no, he's, he does not know Arabic. I said, how many pages do you read? Between 80 to 100 pages per day. So how come you cannot understand a book and you are reading and reading if you don't get the benefit. So for the scholars, the Quran does not address only the mind. As, as a human being, we have different dimensions. It also addresses to other dimensions. Intellectual dimension is one of them. And therefore, it's not bothering. It's not annoying when you read the Quran. Muslims have been reading this in the last 1400 years. You know, how come? 
a book you do not understand, but you read again, recite again and again and again and again. I think there are some type of healing there. It's, it's helping psychologically. They see the taste of this. They see the benefit. Otherwise, you know, if you don't have any benefit, you know, you can do once, twice, three times, then say, oh, no, no need. I, I don't have, what's in for me? But no one is forcing these people to read or recite the Quran. So that's why I think, you know, my argument that as we read the Quran, also Quran reads us as well. However, the criteria is, you know, it should be done accordingly mm -hmm. based on recitation, of the, the rules of recitation. Also, the, the spiritual perspective, it should be just, you know, what we call for sake of Allah in Islam. Not any expectation, no financial benefit, not for having position, not for show off. Or Sal is a good reciter. When it is done in such way, and also the etiquette of reading recitation, and we will be able to get particularly the psychological benefit of the Quran. In regard to your application, back to your question, Zuleha, uh, I, I did this, particularly for those who have some mental disorder problems. What I did because uh, as I said, I tried to keep their five senses busy. First, I need to build a trust. If someone does not trust you, you cannot help. The first step. So it takes time. And second, instead of saying, look, uh, you have a mental problem, or you, unfortunately, some Muslims, they say, oh, you are possessed by jinns, try that, they, they increase the level of the fear. I never said something like that. I said, well, how about if you read the Quran for me? Do you like to read the Quran? Mm, yes. Would you like to read the Quran for me? So I didn't say, let me read for the Quran for you. I didn't put myself up, put him down. You are ill. I am the doctor or spiritual doctor. I want to heal you. No, I never did this. I said, how about if you read some Quran for me? And they did it. And sometimes, you know, of course, you, you, you can't see such person always on the phone. You know, uh, then I, I told them, well, you know, we learn from each other. I am not an academic. I am not a sheikh or I'm not an imam. Consider me as a, as a, your student or as, as a student as well. So uh, we'll discuss like, like a friendly manner. I said, well, okay, on the phone, you know, my master, uh, can you read the Quran today for me? Instead of saying, I want to read for you. So then gradually they, you know, feel the benefit of the recitation. When they feel the benefit of the recitation, then they continue by themselves. So keeping their five cents busy. Then I asked them how to apply this. Did you go to picnic? Do you go to picnic? He says, yes. Next time when you go to picnic, look at the universe with eyes of the wisdom. See the beauty of that flower, of that rose, you know, the, the, the garden, the tree, how Allah created in a perfect way. Look at the flies. Think in such way, see the art. Mm -hmm. Because according to Sayyid Nursi, every creation reflect at least 20 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Name of Khalik, the creator. Yeah. Uh, we have some questions that are coming in for you. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming over here today and talking to us, which are inspiring words. Uh, this question is coming from Aisha Aaron, and she, first she's thanking you for touching upon the role of psychology on Islam. So she'd like to thank you for that. So the question reads, are there any specific examples where the prophet advise slash read certain verses? And or does your research shows this fall um, this for all people, not for Mus just for Muslims? Could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, good question, particularly the second part of that. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, that in, in the Tibbin, yeah, in the Tibbin Nabawi books or in, in the Hadith books, the Prophet recited uh, some uh, certain Quranic verses or chapters, uh, such as uh, one of them is called Ayat al-Kursi, uh, it's chapter 2, verse 255. And the last two chapters of the Quran, the Prophet recited the chapter of Fatiha particularly because, uh, and, and again, according to uh, Sayyid Nursi, the chapter of Fatiha, the first chapter or chapter of opening 
It is the index of the Quran. It is the abstract of the Quran. So the Prophet also recommended or recited uh, chapter of Fatiha as well. Whether this worked for non-Muslim from my personal experience, yes. Because when I was working as a chaplain at the boss at, at the you know in the at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, I was visiting non-Muslim patients as well, not just Muslims. Probably 80% of my patients would be non-Muslims. So we were not there for proselytizing the religion. We were there to provide kind of like a, a comfort, a spiritual, emotional comfort. And of course, I would sometimes tell them, look, uh, even my appearance, like Middle Eastern appearance, a bit my dark skin, uh, I'm a Muslim. And, and some of them, okay, well, we do English prayer, some common prayer. And they will say, how about if you do prayer in, in your tradition to me? Then I would recite the Quran. And they would say that, oh, I, I feel better. I feel better after listening to the Quran. I felt better. So the, the thing is here that, uh, yes, you know, definitely when you believe in the Quran, kind of like according to Sayyid Nursi, open the spiritual treasure for you. But if I look at it like as a book, an ordinary book, I try to find out errors and, you know, to argue it against the Muslims, then I will not get the benefit of the Quran. So those who approach at least objectively, or they listen objectively, they will see the benefit of the Quran. I think even I came across there are some videos on YouTube that some non-Muslims are, uh, you know, reading or, sorry, listening to the Quran and, and they, they benefited. They benefited. So yes, non-Muslims, uh, they benefited as well. Uh, so when, when you apply, when I was a uh, chaplain, here in Australia, in, in the correctional centers, uh, sometimes, you know, because when, when I go there, I would, I would make an announcement, look, a Muslim chaplain here, uh, for, for Muslims, I would do in Arabic, in Turkish, in, in, in you know, English, and sometimes non-Muslim will come as well. When the non-Muslim comes, of course, you know, as a Muslim, we would recite the Quran. That's my kind of like part of my chaplaincy work. Instead of talking, I try to read the Quran, to recite the Quran. And they would listen and they would come you know, by themselves uh, with free choice. And also from their personal experience that they, although they did not understand the meaning, they said that, well, uh, we felt better. It helped. So yes, non-Muslims, I think they, they get helps as well. But as I said, it should be done accordingly. So you mentioned about nursings, uh, nurses, the message for sick. Uh, can you elaborate this a little further for us, please? Well, uh, let me begin with uh, one of my anecdotes it's, that I came across. There are many in my life, in my chaplaincy life. Uh, one day I visited uh, a patient who was a convert, American convert. Uh, she was probably over 65 years old. And after a few days, probably two days, I, when I visited her, I gave her, by the way, the message for Sikh, that booklet of Said Nursi. And after two days, I went up to see her again. Uh, the nurse, before I entered her room, uh, she said that, oh, thank you for your last visit. Uh, I said, thank you too. And uh, may I ask why? Uh, she said that uh, after your visit, we got her results. The results show that you know, she was diagnosed with a cancer. So doctor, myself, and a psychologist went to her room. We told her that, you know, you have approximately six months time to live after you may die in, after six months. So do some preparation. This is the problem. This is that what we could do. And you know, here is the results. And when... She said that when I said this, she starts smiling. I said, look, we are telling her you are going to die in six months. She's happy. <laughs> That's something not normal. And, and then the patient told them that uh, when they say, you know, how come you, you are smiling? Said, she said, yes. Well, I got a booklet uh, that uh, the chaplain, Muslim chaplain gave it to me, the message for sick. I read it uh, seven times. I read, I cried, I cried, I read again. So 
uh, then uh, I'm ready to die. It's kind of like provided a psychological comfort because uh, Nursi wrote this when he was ill as well. You know, what he does in, in that booklet, it's interesting that, you know, he says, and one day also, one man I thought, if I have time, yes, I visited a patient that who had no religion. When I entered his room, it looked that he was, you know, kind of like well-educated person. So I introduced myself after short discussion. I did not mention anything about religion because he had no religion. Well, I said that, you know, whatever you are facing, we discussed a bit his health problem. We talk about it. I said, look, whatever you are facing, you have sufficient power to overcome in your nature. And however, as a human being, sometimes we think too much about the past. You know, why did it happen? Why and why and why and why that will make you more sick. And then you think also extremely about the future, what's going to happen. And then what happens, whatever the power we have, you are dividing in three parts. So then we have less for today to face the challenges. And the, he said that, do you know whom you are talking to? I said, no, well, we are retired. He said, I taught psychology for three years at Boston University. He said that, but these points are very interesting to me. You know, you have the power, but you are dividing this power in three parts. So psychologically, you know, then you have less for today to face such challenges. So Nursi emphasized on this a lot. I, there is a, in the Quranic verse, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa usaha. You know, Allah does not put burden on your shoulder that you can't bear it. I look at more than 40 exegetical works of this Quranic verse. What does it mean? What, what, how about scholars comment on this? So there is unanimous agreement that whatever we face, the challenges, difficulties, we have potential in our nature that we can manage it. We can, you know, at least bear such difficulties. However, you know, to one of, I think, the psychologist or chaplain's task is to guide the client or the patient to discover himself or herself, that to discover such potentiality. What is potential? It's in our nature. Then uh, we can say that, you know, how come, you know, sometimes it's beyond our nature. That's right. This is a fact. Uh, let me give you an, an, an anecdote. Imam Shafi, one of the great scholars of a great, greatest jurists in Islamic history, one day he was in Kaaba, he said that whoever is going to ask me a question, I am going to respond from the Quran. There was a funny man, he said, let me defeat the, that great Imam. He said, Imam, yes, can you tell me uh, how can we make bread from the Quran? Then Imam Shaf said, well, go and call the baker, the near, nearby one. And they say they called him and he asked him, how did you make bread? How do you make bread? So he started explaining. Uh, at the end, the funny man said, oh, Imam, you are supposed to give me the answer from the Quran. He said, yes, Quran says, if you don't know, ask those who, are, those who know. So the Quran, you know, guide me to find out in a way to answer your questions. So I think here, yeah, yes, human beings have a potential, but we are not aware of this. So it is, it is the psychologist task, duty. This also, by the way, in the, in the Western uh, academia, if one of them, for example, Jared Egan, he has a book uh, about that. And he says that every human being has such potential. This is based on his almost 25, 30 years of personal chaplaincy experience. However, it is the psychologist's task and chaplain's task to guide the client or patient to be aware of this undiscovered or unused skills 
to face for facing the challenges. So what Mushi does in the message for Sikh, I think he gives the example of that. Psychologically, as well as spiritually. And even I distributed, you know, such uh, message for Sikh uh, to, to my non-Muslim patients because it's, it's, it's a universal. Uh, I remember one of the chaplains from New Hampshire, she asked me uh, to send some of these booklets because she was distributing, distributing to her pa patients as well. So it is not just for the Muslims, I think it's good for the non-Muslims as well. And it's very interesting. It's small, but really helpful for those who are ill. So I visited that lady, the American convert, and she said that, well, thank you so much for giving me such booklet. And I made copies, 10 copies I gave to my daughter to distribute my friends who are ill in, in, in Boston, different, you know, in suburbs. And interesting that, and she was so happy, uh, you know, to read that book. And, and, and read again, again, and again. Yeah. Dr. Salih Yücel, uh, I once had a friend, she was uh, going through stage four cancer, an American friend of mine. She was very interested in, you know, spiritual matters as well. She practiced chaplaincy in her own life as a Christian. And I remember uh, I, sh I shared with her the message of Forsek, of Said Nursi. And she told me herself that she found great comfort in reading the booklet and that she said, I decided that I will read a section of it every day just to comfort myself and, you know, keep my uh, hopes up. Uh, I would like to ask you another question, which I will combine with a question of, um, you know, that we receive in uh, YouTube. Uh, of Aisha Arun again, she uh, says if, uh, are there any specific examples where the prophet, peace be upon him, advised or re read certain verses? This is her question. Yes, uh, you know, for, for detail of that, again, we, we need to look at the, the Hadith books, uh, in Bukhari, the, the section of uh, uh, the prophetic medicine, the Tabin Nababi, and other books. Uh, there are some of these hadiths are authentic, some of them they are not. But even if they are not still there, hadith and they, it can be applied. Uh, as I said, that previously, uh, the chapter of, uh, sorry, the, the, the verse of Ayat al Kursi and uh, some other short verses, short chapters are recommended. Some certain chapter of the Quran, such as Surah Yasin, is recommended, Surah Rad is recommended. Uh, and, and some certain, I can't remember all, yet, yes, there are. But I think when we, what, what the nurse brings here, I think there's a very unique point that I, ne I never read from in any other books. He says that when you read or recite such chapters or such dua or dhikr or remembrance, your aim should be to please Allah, not to heal yourself. Because at the end, Allah is the healer. Because the, reading the Quran, making dua, recitation or dhikr, remembrance, is their act of the worship. So when we worship, we should not seek the worldly benefit. However, if Allah wishes, Allah gives. I know it's a bit difficult question, particularly for those you know, don't have kind of a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive knowledge about Islam. Like what, you know, let me say, I perform my daily prayer. So should I do this for getting some benefit? No, I do this for, for my life hereafter purpose. So similarly, since recitation of the Quran or reading of the Quran or making dhikr or making dua, all of them are act of the worship and the aim it should be only for Allah and expectation should be for hereafter. However, as I said that, if Allah wishes, Allah gives. When we do this, the success you know, uh, rate, it will be much higher than, okay, I'm going to read the Quran just for healing purpose. So the aim here should be you know, for the hereafter expectation, the reward in hereafter, eternal happiness. However, 
if Allah wishes, gives in this world and benefit. Definitely, there is a benefit. But we cannot say that, you know, always I should see the benefit. And also, one thing is that I think it's very common in the West. They say, you know, why me? Why me? And Nursi, he explained this in the message for sick in, in, a, in, in a profound way. He says, first of all, you know, your body does not belong to you. You did not create this. You did not purchase from the shops. It's belong to God. And he gave, he gave an example. He says, you know, if a cloth fashioner hires you with a high amount of salary and then put you on a garment on you. And then if, if the fashioner tells you, walk, sit down, stand up, you know, lay down. Uh, and the, the aim is, you know, to alter the garment. And he wants to show, you know, the, uh, his arts or her arts, you know, in, in the fashion. So can you say that, what are you doing to me? You are annoying me. You are bothering me. Why are you telling me, you know, sit down, stand up? Do you have a right to say this? He said, no, because you are already getting your salary. So he says that human being, the body is not belong to us. And already Allah gave, gives a, each human being with many numerous blessings. But sometimes Allah wants to reflect his names, his arts. So if I, when I get hungry, I realize that there's a provider, a razak. When I get ill, I realize that there's a healer. If I don't get ill, how should I know? How would I know that there's a healer? If I never get hungry, it's not possible to know that there's a provider. So therefore, human being reflects names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes, you know, you will be in a pity state. Then we see how the mercy of Allah, you know, when we get sick, we see that everyone is helping you. When you're in the hospital, nurse, doctor, psychologist, family members. But when you're at home, no one. So through the illness, we understand also our shortcomings and weaknesses and that we are impotent. And we are going to die sooner or later. So it's a warning also. Prepare yourself for the eternal happiness. But that's why whatever is happening to us, we shouldn't look at only from the worldly perspective. Islam also makes you to look, we call akhirat centric, centric, which is, you know, the life hereafter centric as well. Because as a human being, we are the most valuable creation. We are not just created for this world. If it is just for this world, God is not good because the, the life passed so quickly. Human being, if you ask any single person on earth, they would like to have an eternal, eternal life. If God does not create this, God is not good. So, that's why what is happening to us, we should look at also from the life here after perspective, not just the worldly perspective. Dr. Sali, I would like to ask you, you mentioned that human beings are connected, you know, to the spiritual and corporeal worlds. So for those who yes. not have access and the um, ability to seek medical, you know, help, do you, is it okay if someone like me um, apply the FIHA, you know, because we need to enforce them, you know, not to leave because isolation and the useness of the mind, that's what it creates, you know, and amplify the fear. Is it possible for the community, for friends to apply FIHA in order to help others around them that do not have the resources that other people have? Uh, can, can you repeat your question, please? My mind was somewhere else, sorry. No, no, that's okay. So what I'm saying is for those people that do not have access or the resources to seek medical help, yep. is it possible for someone like me to apply fear just to help them to not be isolated, to keep their mind you know, busy? Because when you don't use your mind, that's where you create a space for, you know, for fear, 
for things, the thoughts that are not positive. So if you reminded people of their value or how they contribute to the community, can we do that to help others? Yes, yes, we can. But I think, again, there should be some certain criteria. Okay, yeah. Of course, for those who don't have, you know, access to, let me say, insurance or, or, med, uh, or any, any type of medication, uh, you know, still they can use the, the Islamic spiritual healing as well. The Islam, by the way, in Islam, according to many scholars, Al-Ghazali says, uh, you know, seeking medication is an obligation. Let me say first, is an obligation. Uh, but if someone cannot have due to different reasons, maybe poverty, war, or, you know, isolation, you know, uh, I think when you help, you are not kind of like a creating fear. I think what, what you're helping, a guiding her, but that guidance, instead of creating the fear, I think it should be through questioning. Let me say, oh, are you happy with this situation? Have you tried other alternatives? Well, why, why don't you think that such thing can be helpful for you? Instead of imposing or instead of creating fear, I think showing the alternative ways. Because as a human being, you know, the fear always, it's the most weakness part of our nature the most weakness part of human nature. And it, regrettably, it's been manipulated by many. So therefore, how we can minimize this fear, this should be our first aim. But sometimes, you know, you need also to say something that it could create a little bit fear, but the, the consequence will be beautiful or the consequence you think that it will be better. In such case, yes. Uh, so again, it depends case by case, or, you know, very difficult to make a general statement. It should be case by case. We, we need to look at from the different angles than to make a right decision. Otherwise, whatever we do, it may, it may not be right. Thank you. I have another question, if it's okay with you. Um, I think it is very timely because we are in the month of Shaban and Ramadan is coming up, the month of Ramadan that the Quran is revealed. So Muslims all around the world uh, are more, you know, engaged in re reciting the Quran. So my first question is, even if they don't intend, do you think they receive the benefits? And the second question is, uh, are there any other practices of the prophetic tradition where we can uh, relate today for healing? And uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, definitely, they, they will benefit from the Quran mm -hmm. to different levels. You know, let me say uh, 10 people, they are sitting on the same table, having the same food, but the taste will be different. Not everyone will get the taste in the same level. So that depends on spiritual life, depends on dedication, depends on intention, depends on the way of frustration and so on. In regard to your second question, uh, yes. Uh, although uh, I, I just read, I think Ibn Majah, one of the Hadith books, uh, the Prophet said, look at the trees for psychological healing. You know, trees, so the greeny things. I, I read, I listened somewhere, but I couldn't read in any way, but I, I still, I don't know whether it's Hadith or not. But it says that, you know, for the, for the, for the uh, psychological healing, look at the, the sea the ocean or, you know, the, the water. If you cannot find, then look at the greens. Could be tree, grass, or something else. If you cannot find, and then look at the eyes of your parents for, for the psychological benefit. Uh, this is, again, it's recommended. So that's why, uh, yes, uh, there are also the prophets also ask the people to change the environment. Mm -hmm change the environment. The cleaning is very important. Then a clean of the room, the house, and the clothing and everything. That would be also helpful. Again, it's recommended. Touching. Touching, you know, Prophet Sallallahu because he would touch the patients. And touching also is helps. Helps. And in addition, being present. No need, you know, to go and talk. Just go at the presence of a patient, touch the patient, and listen. The, one of the best therapy is also a visit. Even I read, which is 
not authentic hadith, you know, a visit sometimes is more rewarding than doing a nafila hajj, which is not obligation, you know, extra hajj. Then I said, how come, you know, you're going to hajj, you're spending 10, 20 days there, most sacred place, you're making dua. But sometimes a visit can help a person's faith, can be the reason of healing. I will, I will not because nine o'clock, I want to finish with one thing. I have a friend here who worked for the road service. And one day he said that I received a text message. There's a car broken somewhere outside of Melbourne and go and just fix it. So he went 70, 80 Ks, 50 miles for, for America. Uh, he saw a, just a farm. No one is around, no car. He said, so I knocked the door, An old lady came out. I introduced myself and she started weeping. I said, what's wrong? She said, please come in. So I went in, she made a cup of coffee for me. And she said that, look, I have a car is in the garage. Actually, my car is not broken. I'm sorry I lied. For the last six months, I haven't seen any human being in my life. Can I touch you? Can I touch you? She said, I just wanted to see a human. You know, I can't drive. I'm not allowed to drive because of my age. And I have children. They don't come. So can I just touch you? And she wept for a while. So even a visit, I think, is the best therapy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank well, you. Uh, thank you so much for such program. I think it was a uh, very timely and, and good program. Uh, thank and you. So it's thank you for you joining us. Thank you for joining us today. Before we wrap up, I would like to share with you a message that we received, I think personally relating to you. Uh, Sadri Altunok from uh, Long Island sent you this message. Thank you, Salih Yücel abi. Always a star. All Long Islanders sending you their gratitude for setting up the first cultural center in Long Island, New York. Thank you. Well, I, I left my soul there. So that's why uh, I, I love the people there as well. Uh, please, uh, I also my salam to, to them all. Not just everyone, all, all audience as well. Uh, well, when the people ask me, I said one third of me is an American, one third of Australian, one third is, is Turkish. So that's why still... Uh, my soul comes to Australia and goes back to the United States. Thank I'm traveling you. Traveling between Thank the you. two. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. much. It was a great okay. program. We enjoyed Welcome. a lot from it. We learned a lot. And uh, I'm sure because it is coming up to <clears throat> Ramadan soon, I'm sure. Uh, you know, our audience will have a different perspective of in their relationship with the Quran from now on. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your energy and your wisdom and knowledge sharing with us. Well, ha happy, happy Ramadan to you all. Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs>